You know, uh, one thing about people is they don't stay in their own lane. And obviously this morning, there were so many people trying to tell me what I'm supposed to do. Because uh, for those of you who uh, are familiar, uh, I, I like to play miniature golf. And back in the old days, we used to uh, play church basketball. And uh, got a little old for that. And volleyball, got a little old for that. So I, I took up miniature golf, and uh, so we started playing miniature golf. <clears throat> and um, so anyway, the church has been invited, and we bought a little medal, this little medal right here that says miniature golf champion. And um, so anyway, we have a few sanctioned events, and we had one last night. You know, it's kind of weird. All you guys who like looking at me today thinking, uh-huh, well, where were you last night? You know, a night when it wasn't a sanctioned event, 20 people show up. When last night the trophy's online, all y'all scared to death. You need to go to Walmart and get your big old can of scared to death and drink it and come on out and play. All right? But anyway, I had to go. I had to go. Uh, I, yesterday before I went to the golf game, I had to, I had to go. Dev had me bury some uh, big old thing in the ground. And so I was out there trying to put that thing in the ground. Of course, I hurt my finger. And uh, it was actually bleeding, man. It was, uh, I bent my fingernail back. And then I, then, then I, I as I was, as Ben and I was shoveling, man, I dropped the metal on my toe. I was wearing flip-flops. You saw it. Did you see it? And I, like, was limping around, yelling, screaming. So I was already at a very, very disadvantage when I was going to play putt-putt. And uh, I knew it was going to take a Herculean effort in order for me to pull that thing off, being as injured as I was. And so we went up there, and uh, it was about nine of us. And, and Chris, man, he started off, and, and if you have to know our little rules, we got you, you can mess up on one hole and you get a mulligan. You can start it all over. Well, at the very first hole, there's just like this rock. And you got to go to the left of the rock in order to, you know, get, it, get in the hole. And, and all the women had gotten it in, too. And then Chris comes up there and hits it behind the rock. And it goes like way over where there's no, it's impossible for him to get it in four. And so he just picks up his ball and says, I'm using a mulligan. I'm like, what? You use a mulligan on the first hole? That's crazy, man. And uh, so I thought to myself, this guy is going to be like really easy to beat. I mean, he kind of stinks, right? And all of a sudden, that guy hit his mulligan. He got like a two or something. Next hole, he gets like a hole in one. And, and he's off to the races. And so, show up the picture there, Robert. So, we now have a new world champion, Chris Shumate. Come on up, brother. Man, he not only took me down, man. I didn't given up about sixteen. He is, I'm telling you, this guy was on a roll last night, was he not, William? Now, William Spencer was battling him out the whole way, but man, I didn't given up. I didn't. I, there was no way I could keep up with those two pros, so I kind of just said, settled in, and said, all right, I'm just gonna watch a match. And I kept hoping that Chris would put both hands around his neck and choke it out, but he didn't. He kept on playing through it and made it all the way. All right, enough of the uh, sadness. I know all my fans are disappointed, but that's okay. I'm not done yet. My toe will heal, my thumb will heal, and I'll be back. <laughs> if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask you to turn with me the book of John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Hey, oh, ch yeah, John Eleanor always forgets my poor little kitties. Children's Church, uh, y'all can go ahead on back. Uh, man, they so excited. Here they go. That's what Eli comes to church for, his children's church. There he goes. Oh, other day, if y'all if y'all need to meet Eli, Eli is Mr. William and Miss Kitty's grandson. And other day, my wife was talking to Eli very seriously, and she said, "Eli, I like your cowboy boots." And he said, "Yeah." And uh, my wife said, "I bet the girls really like them." He said, "Yes, they do." And uh, Miss, uh, uh, my wife asked him, said, do you have a girlfriend? He said, I got four. 
And he, she said, you got four? And he said, yes, uh, I got one at school, and I got one at the church, and I got one who lives near me, and he named another one that he's got. And I, so y'all pray for Eli as he juggles these four women. He says that they don't know about each other. So this is a pretty hard secret for that joker to keep, man. Like granddaddy, like grandson, I reckon. I don't know with all these w women killers around here. <laughs> John chapter 10. I'm going to start off with a verse. It says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the Father are one. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we pray this morning that, God, you would lead in God as we study your word together. And, Father, I know there's some here that, Lord Jesus, need to hear this message. And so, Father, I pray that you would soften all of our hearts, that we may hear your voice this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're constantly surrounded by voices. Voices telling you who you are, voices telling you what you are, voices telling you what to do. There's voices that come from outside us. Some of us still hear voices from our childhood, voices that try to manipulate us, voices that give worldly advice, voices that call you names, voices that may say that you're stupid or that you're ugly. Voices that can rationalize away sin, like a used car salesman selling you a clunker of a car. And so often we hear these voices. Then there's voices that are inside us that we hear, inside of our hearts. And we hear these voices, voices inside our head. Maybe the voices from the outside have now become the voice on your inside you know I remember when I was in rehab there was a counselor and he talked about a shame box and he said people who are addicts have a lot of shame and where that shame comes from usually comes from your childhood from the voices that you took in and he says that's why some of you can't take a compliment you know, you can, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, you're good looking, you kind of, well, whatever. They're crazy. But if somebody comes to you and says, you're stupid, you receive that because that's what you already think of yourself. And you see how you perceive yourself and the voices inside your head, if those voices outside line up with those voices that are already ringing in your heart and in your head, you agree. You go, yes, yeah, me. It's me. And we oftentimes hear these voices that tell us we're inadequate, that we're not enough, that we're disappointment, that we're not worthy. I know because I grew up with these voices. And, you know, a lot of times people tend to think that there's like a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder and both of them are whispering in your ear. It's not true. There's a whole committee of them. You know, there, there's all kind of voices inside that head, isn't it? You know, arguing with one another, fighting with one another, and you're trying to listen to the voice. And Jesus says that he wants you to stop for a moment and listen to his voice. You see, this whole chapter of John chapter 10 is dedicated to voices. Voices of strangers. Voices of thieves and robbers. Voices of those who want to destroy your life. Voices of those who even want to kill you. And in this passage, Jesus is inviting you to be one of his sheep. And he an analogizes that by saying, I want to be your shepherd. What does that mean? I want to be your guide. I want to be the one who leads you to the greener pastures, to, beside the still waters, that even in the valley of the shadow of death, you would have to fear no evil because I'm with you and I want to be there with you. You know, and so Jesus wants to be our shepherd. And he appeals to us in this passage to why he should be our shepherd. Because first of all, Jesus wants to tell you who he is. 
In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus wants to let you know that he knows exactly who you are, and he knows exactly what you need, and that he's always going to protect you. He's always going to guard you. And, and he's even willing to go so far as to lay down his life for you. And the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, it says that God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we were not good sheep when Christ died. We were rebellious people. And yet Jesus went to the cross and he died in our place. He died in our stead, and he took all of our sin and all of our shame upon him, and we can stand before God in his cloth in the righteousness of Christ. The Bible says that you, even though you, think, you may think you're unworthy and you hear that voice of unworthiness in your mind, Jesus says that you can boldly approach the throne of grace. You can stand before in the presence of God because of what Jesus did for you upon the cross. Jesus also wants to tell you how he feels about you. In John chapter 10, verse 12 through 13, it says the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. When the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it, the man runs away because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus is wanting to tell you how much he loves you that he's not going to abandon you, that he's not going to leave you. You know, the Bible teaches us that God is love. And, and I have a really hard time because for years and years, I was a Christian and didn't really realize just how much God loved me. I mean, I'd heard all the stories before about how Jesus loves you. I, I learned the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children, All the Children of the World. I, I knew the songs, but, but it never had infiltrated my heart. Because I didn't think I was good enough or worthy enough to be loved by God. After all, I was a sinner, man, and I'd let God down so many times. But the, but, and, and so I was always doubting my salvation. I was always wo wondering, you know, just kind of hoping I would go to heaven, that, that somehow I could make it there by the skin of my teeth. But Jesus says that if I try to make it on my own, I'm not going to make it. It's only through his grace and through his blood that I can boldly approach the throne of grace. It's only by his grace and his blood that I can have eternal life. It's his love that allows that to happen. And I don't know what other people say about you and what other people think about you. And I don't even know if you necessarily love yourself, but I want to tell you that Jesus loves you. God loves you. His very nature is love. He cannot help but love you. And although there's so many voices of unforgiveness, there's so many voices of condemnation around us, the Bible says in Romans 8.1, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If the voices you are hearing tell you that you're unworthy, that you're not good enough, that you're stupid, the fact is, is that that's not voices not coming from God. Because the, God doesn't deal with us in that way. God deals with us from love. And his voice is always loving. It's still and it's small and it's gentle. Jesus says, I am gentle, and my yoke is light. Jesus also wants to tell you that he wants a relationship with you. He wants to know you intimately. Look what it says in John chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus wants you in a relationship with him. He wants to know you. I mean, he wants you to know him. You see, the truth is that God already knows all about you. He was there when you were born. He was there when people abused you. He was there when you were neglected. He was there when you were brokenhearted. He saw it all. He saw you stand. He saw you fall. He was always there. And he knows everything about you. The Bible teaches that even the hairs on your head are numbered. For me, that's not as many as for many of you. But he knows all about you. And yet he loves you in spite of you. 
because you are his child. You are his sheep. And, and even though he knows you, you may not know him. And that's why God wants to develop a relationship with you that you may intimately know him. You may intimately know him. Jesus also wants to tell you what he wants to give you. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Have abundant life. What does Jesus want to give you? He doesn't want to just take you into heaven. Jesus wants to give you life here and now. Most of us just exist. Jesus wants you to have life. He wants you to experience peace and joy and love, and he wants to offer that to you. And if you follow him and hear his voice, he will lead you into those places. He doesn't just want you to go to heaven. He wants you to live an abundant life here and now. And some of you can relate when I say this. Is there something that seems to be missing in your life? There's got to be more than just a graduating high school and finding a girlfriend or going to college and getting a job and getting married and having a few kids. There's got to be more to it than that. And Jesus is who is the one that provides more. More than simply existence. He wants to give you life. There has to be more to life than what we have. And that which is missing is Jesus. The Bible also tells us Jesus wants to tell you that he will never leave nor abandon you. In John chapter 10, verse 27 through 30, he says, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never die. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. I am glad that my relationship with God is not dependent upon me, but it's dependent upon Jesus. And the very fact that I'm going to heaven is not because of the good I do, but because of the good Jesus has done. When Jesus went to that cross and he died in my place and he died in my stead, he died while I was yet a sinner. And he demonstrates his love for me while I'm yet a sinner. You know, too often churches teach you that you got to do this and do that to be right with God. That's not true. That's a lie. That's one of those voices you don't need to listen to. The only thing, the Bible says that the only good works you can do is believe. That's it. That's all you can do. Because every single one of us in this room is a sinner. And every single person that listens to me by Facebook or any other media, they are a sinner. They are a sinner. They may keep it hidden better than you. They may not struggle with the same things that you struggle with. But every person is a sinner. And it doesn't take a bunch of sins to send you to hell, or it doesn't take murder, uh, being a murderer to send you to hell. All it takes to send you to hell is being born. Because the Bible says in John chapter 3 that we are condemned already if we've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We are already condemned, and we're already on our way to hell. And there's no escape from that except through the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did for us upon that cross. There is a freedom. And truly understanding that salvation is not dependent upon me, but upon what Jesus did. There's a freedom to know that I cannot be snatched out of his hand. That I cannot be taken out of his hand. That, that there is no one who's greater than God. And Jesus says, I am God. I and the Father are one. And nobody can take you out of my hand. And that even includes you. I believe that. That once you've committed yourself to God, once you become his sheep, he's not going to disinherit you. He's not. You're on the road to becoming and conformed into the image of Christ. He is the strength. He is the protector. Our salvation and life is not in our hands, but he is. The creator of the universe now holds you in his hands. And look what it says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. God has said, never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. Now listen, I think that God speaks the truth. Now, the Bible just sit there and said that he would never leave me nor forsake me. There is nothing I can do for God to leave me. I may choose to leave God. I may choose to be a sheep that's like one of the one that goes, you know, one that goes astray while the 99 stay in the fold. But guess what? His reckless love is still going to pursue me, isn't it? 
Because Jesus says he will lead the 99 to go after the one. Now we may wonder, but God's never going to lead nor forsake us. He's never going to give up on us. He's never going to cast us aside. And if he ever casts one person aside, he's a liar. Because he just said, I will never leave nor forsake you. Mm. I was, um, I'm a PE teacher. And I know this. Y'all can look at my physique and tell that. Um, I'm a PE teacher for uh, young kids. And we played kickball. We've been, been playing kickball. We played kickball the other day. And uh, I, I rolled the ball up there, and they kick it. And, of course, then I'm the umpire and all that stuff. And so I rolled it up there, and this little girl, she got on base. And all of a sudden, she started walking off the base and going back to the bench. I was like, what are you doing? She's like, uh, I'm out. I said, how are you out? They told me I was out. I said, there's only one voice in this gym you need to listen to, and that's me. If I didn't call you out, you safe. And so as I, I started thinking about this message when I said that, my sheep hear my voice, and they know. You see, God has the final say about you, not anybody else. And the world is going to condemn you and the world is going to ridicule you. And maybe even those who are your family, maybe those who, who at one time should be the closest to you, condemn you and call you names and the voices are not our voices that, that hurt you. But the voice of God is always one who says, you're safe. You're not out. I'm the base. Stay with me. I've got you. Now, there is one more key, and I'm going to close up real quickly here. But in Matthew chapter 7, there's a story that Jesus tells. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. And it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house upon the rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Now, I believe that Jesus uses this illustration to teach us a very important lesson about hearing his voice. You know, Jesus says that there were, he uses the analogy of two houses being built. One house was built upon a rock and man, the winds and storms came. Trust me, I don't know if you're in a storm right now, but if you're not, one's coming. You know, that hurricane, uh, remind, the devastation that a hurricane brought in Florida, sometimes our lives have felt like that, haven't it? Man, we're just devastating. Just, I mean, out of the blue, it suddenly hits and just destroys everything in its path. Well, trust me, if you're not going through a storm right now, there's one on the horizon. That's just life. The book of Job says, man born of woman is full of sorrow, and that's true. We're all going, going to have storms that's going to come upon us. But Jesus says there's one house that's going to stand, and the other house is going to fall because the foundation. The foundation of one house is built upon a solid foundation, a rock. The other house is built upon a uh, shifting uh, foundation of sand. Now, what is the difference between the house that stood and the house that fell? It's not that they heard the voice of Jesus. It says, he who hears these words of mine and does them. It's like a man who builds his house upon the rock. You know, Jesus can, you can hear Jesus' voice. And the more you're obedient to his voice, the more he ends up speaking to you. And Right now, there's maybe a lot of voices that go on in your head, but the moment you truly stop and try to develop that relationship with Jesus through reading his word, through being active in church, uh, and, and through listening to the Holy Spirit and meditating upon the things of God, as you begin to be obedient to those things, God's going to lead you to greater things. He's going to speak to you, and he wants to speak to you. And let me tell you this, when God speaks to you, you're going to know it. It's not going, it may not be in an audible voice, but you're going to know it's of God. He's going to give you thoughts that you never thought before. He's going to ask you to do things you never dreamed possible. But this great shepherd is trying to lead you on to greener pastures. He's trying to take you on to greater things. I'm going to ask you to stand with me.